Hi, physics students, uh, and welcome to uh, the second section of option D, astrophysics. Uh, in this uh, next couple of videos, there are three videos in topic D2, and I'm going to talk about stellar characteristics and stellar evolution, okay? So this is going to get quite a bit more technical than the first section, uh, which was D1. So the first thing I want to talk about is kind of a throwback to something we've talked about before, especially in topics um, 7 and topic 12 when we talked about um, atomic spectra. Now it turns out that um, if by studying the atomic spectra of stars, which is called spectroscopy, <laughs> it's a tough word to say, can tell us four things about stars. So the first thing, which is very important, is the temperature of a star. Okay. Now we can use the um, we can use the intensity against wavelength graph. Okay, uh, using Bean's law and the radiation spectra curves. All right, and remember that this equation right here is given to you in your data booklet, actually under topic D two. All right, and this is um, Bean's law relating uh, the maximum uh, wavelength to the temperature. And of course, for this particular star, which is uh, which is our sun, you get that it's a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin, about 6,000 Kelvin. Okay, so you need to be able to do these kinds of problems on the IB exam. Okay, so the second thing that stellar spectra can tell us are the, is the chemical composition of stars, right? Um, so in order to do this, we can utilize the absorption spectra for light. Again, we've studied this before, okay? And remember the difference between the emission line spectrum and the absorption line spectrum. So just to, um, just to revise this for you, remember that photons of a certain frequency are passed through and absorbed by atoms in the known gas, okay? And what they do is they show up as black lines in the absorption line spectrum. Now, the atmospheres of stars essentially act as like a... Um, as a shell, as a cooler blanket around the hotter interior of a star. So that the typical stellar spectra are the absorption spectra. And remember that the absorption line spectrum for a star tells us the chemical composition of the outer atmosphere, the shell around that star, not what's going on on in the inside. Okay? And it turns out that most stars have the same chemical composition, hydrogen and helium, but they have different absorption spectra. And the reason is because different stars have different temperatures. Okay? Now, to go a little bit farther, <clears throat> it's very important to point out that just because certain lines in an absorption spectrum are not there for a particular star, it doesn't imply the absolute absence of that element. So, for example, if you consider three stars with the same hydrogen um, content, for example, one of them is hot at about 25,000 Kelvin, one is relatively cool at about 10,000 Kelvin, and one is what we're going to call cold at 3,000 Kelvin, and about that, that's about half the temperature of our sun. Okay. Now, the hydrogen atoms in the hot star, it's so hot that they become ionized. And so what happens is that those, those atoms can't absorb light since there are no bound electrons because they're ionized. So the hot star, therefore, doesn't show absorption lines at the hydrogen wavelengths, okay? But the hydrogen atoms are still there, all right? Now, in contrast, the cool star shows absorption lines at, at, at clear, at, clearly at hydrogen wavelengths, as most atoms in that, this particular star, due to its temperature, are in the n equals 2 quantum state. Okay? The cold star has the most atoms in the ground state, and it only absorbs ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. Therefore, the absence of certain lines here obviously does not imply the absence um, of that particular element. So that's important for you guys to understand that qualitatively. All right? A little bit more about the chemical composition of stars. All right? um, stars are uh, sort of ranked or classified uh, based on their temperature, and they have um, they have all of the they have these letters, okay? So physicists, astrophysicists have come up with O B A F G uh, K M. A very good uh, mnemonic, mnemonic device for this would be um, a lot of people say O B A fine girl or guy kiss me, okay? Anyway, it's kind of a fun fun way to remember that, okay? And the thing that you need to know as an IB student is the relative temperatures, the temperature ranges. You don't have to memorize every single range here, but you should know that M begins at about 2,000 Kelvin and O goes up, goes up to about 30,000 Kelvin. And the hotter the star becomes, the less red it becomes and the more blue it becomes, okay? So again, cooler stars are reddish, and very very hot stars are bluish, um, which if you just remember like uh, if you just remember colors of flames for example, like white flames and blue flames are hotter than reddish or orange flames. Okay, so again there are seven spectral classes of stars according to color, 
Um, and the stars will glow a certain color depending on how hot they are. Okay, so that is how, that is why different stars appear to be different colors in the sky, right? Now, here are the atomic spectra uh, and star colors for different kinds of stars. And remember what I said, that temperature plays a role in determining whether or not hydrogen, for example, shows up in that atomic spectra. And you can really see that here. So you can see that all of them have essentially the same chemical composition, the same absorption spectra, but they're at different, um, sort of, I guess, different intensities. Um, depending on the temperature of the stars, okay? All right, another thing that we can tell from stellar spectra is the radial velocity and rotation, and this is really cool. So remember when we talked about the Doppler equation, okay? It turns out that we can analyze the spectral curves um, and we can see by how much they're shifted either towards the blue or towards the red by, since we know, since we know what they're made of chemically, we know where those uh, absorption spectra should be. So if something's moving away from us or moving towards us, those lines, those black lines will actually be shifted slightly. And we can tell from the magnitude of the shift how fast they're going. Um, and the radial velocity and the rotation, it's pretty cool. So if the spectral signatures are shifted towards red, of course, um, the frequency is lower and it's moving away from us. If it's blue, higher frequency moving towards us. And the shifts of frequencies and opposing edges of stars tell us the rotation speed and direction. And I think I mentioned um, earlier that we could, that's how we can determine the, um, the radial velocity or the rotational speed of our sun is we just look at the spectral curves from either side and um, because one side's coming towards us and the other's going away, we can, we can um, deduce that number. It's quite remarkable when you think about it, okay? So again, for example, if we have three identical stars, okay, here's a normal spectrum, stationary. One's moving towards us and one's moving away. You'll see these lines, these absorption lines shifting, okay? And um, the last thing that stellar spectra tell us are the magnetic fields of stars, okay? Um, this is really cool. So it turns out that, that magnetic fields around stars can cause spectral lines to split or separate. And it turns out that the, the more the separation, the stronger the B field. Now you don't necessarily need to know this for the IB and you're certainly not gonna be tested on, you're not gonna have these kinds of questions, but it's kind of a really interesting thing that if you're more interested in that, um, you, sh you should definitely consider taking astrophysics maybe in college, okay? All right. This is one of the most important things that you need to know in this topic, uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams, named after a couple of people named Hertzsprung and Russell, okay? Um, it turns out that in the early 20th century, um, astronomers discovered a very strong correlation between the luminosity and the surface temperature of stars, okay? They looked at lots and lots and lots of data, and they said, wow, so it turns out that, that that the greater the surface temperature, and when I say surface temperature, I'm really talking about the temperature of the outer atmosphere of a star. Okay, anyway, the higher the temperature, the greater the luminosity. Now, this, this, this might seem like, well, like a no-brainer to you, like, well, no kidding, um, but it's actually a little more complicated that, than that. And so what, what um, astronomers have done is they have plotted data from all these hundreds of thousands of stars, basically, um, and they plot that, plotted them on this thing called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and they began to see certain, um, certain trends, okay, um, so, which, which I'll discuss in, in, uh, in much detail here. The first thing you need to realize about the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or the HR diagram, is it's not a graph, it's a chart, it's a diagram. So therefore, talking about trying to fit a best fit line to it is meaningless and somewhat nonsensical, okay? Now, if you notice the way that it's organized here, okay, so on the, on the bottom you have the spectral class according to temperature. Notice that it's a reverse scale, so as you go from and again, it's not a graph, so don't worry about that. But note that the higher temperatures are on the left and the lower temperatures are on the right, okay? On this, uh, on this side, on the left-hand side, and I hesitate to say y-axis because it's not a graph, you have luminosity. And the luminosities on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram are relative to the luminosity of our sun. So for example, our sun is obviously somewhere in here, okay? Because it's got a temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin, five or 6,000 Kelvin, it's somewhere in here. In fact, it's labeled here somewhat erroneously. It's a little bit too low. But anyway, that's our sun. Don't worry about the right-hand side, the absolute magnitude. Absolute magnitude used to be something that was um, that was part of the IB curriculum. The IB decided to take it out because it was too much for you guys. So don't worry about that. You see a lot of Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams with magnitudes on one of the sides, but don't, you don't need to necessarily 
um, worry about that, okay? Now, what is interesting about this, now that we've got a handle of what we're looking at, is um, there's a general trend that there's a whole bunch of stars kind of right in the middle. So generally speaking, um, this is where scientists deduce this fact right here. They said that generally the greater the temperature, the greater the luminosity, right? Okay, so that's why you have, um, you actually have, you actually have very few stars down here, right? So you see a trend, kind of a trend line, but again, it's not a graph. Now, a couple of important things. The mass of the star increases in moving from right to left, okay? So for example, white dwarves, which are down in this area, are more massive than giants and supergiants, which is somewhat counterintuitive. This refers to the giant and supergiant white dwarfs refers to their relative size, okay? All right, the axes are not linear, okay? That's another thing which I, I didn't point out. Um, notice definitely not, not linear here, okay? These are, these are multiples, looks like these are, these are um, two magnitudes apart, okay? The luminosity of the sun is about 3.9 times 10 to the 26 watts, watts, which, of course, you guys know, all right? And once scientists started studying the HR diagrams, they, they, they realized, wow, there's some really clear patterns. And what we can do is we can actually kind of plot the evolutionary paths of stars. Super cool, okay? So here's another um, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram from your SOCOS textbook without the... Um, Let's see, without the, um, without the magnitudes on it. Okay, so here's your surface temperature, luminosity. And over here, you have lines corresponding to um, our solar um, radii. Okay, so all the stars along this line about right here have about the same radius here, here, and here. So pretty cool, huh? Now, um, the thing that the IB really wants you to be able to do is to, is to identify the main regions, and I'm reading this from the IB guide, of the HR diagram and describe the main properties of stars in these regions. So the main regions are these. This area right here, which is kind of this curvy line, is what's called the main sequence. It turns out that stars spend most of their lifetimes on the main sequence. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a, in a bit. Okay, then you have red giants and supergiants, which are to the right of the, of the main sequence. Cepheid variables, which I'll spend a lot of time talking about that, I think, in the next video or the last video in this section. And then you have white dwarfs uh, down here. So remember, the, what the name of the star doesn't imply the mass, it implies the relative size. So you can see 100 solar radiuses radii up here. These are huge stars down here, a tenth of a solar radius. and um, below, those are, those are called dwarfs, okay? So basic stellar ca characteristics. The main sequence stars, the ones that, that appear most stars are in the on the main sequence, okay? Uh, they fuse hydrogen to form helium. helium. Red giants, they're bright, large, relatively cool, okay? They have relatively low temperatures, and they tend to be red as a result, okay? And the red supergiants are even larger and brighter than red giants, okay? So again, very, you have a low temperature, low temperature stars here, but very high luminosity. That is not the main trend that appears on the main sequence, okay? So white dwarfs way down here in the lower left-hand corner tend to be dim, small, hot, whitish, and very, very, very dense, okay? And here's an example of the kind of question that the IB might throw at you. It's kind of a combination of qualitative, maybe a little bit quantitative, but really HR diagram questions are qualitative. So, for example, they'll give you a grid like this. As they say, the diagram shows the grid of an HR diagram, which shows the position of selected stars, okay? Uh, LS is the luminosity of the sun, of course. Um, and then all they want you to do is draw a circle around stars that are red giants, white dwarves, and a line through stars that are main sequence stars. So you can see this is very, very qualitative, right? Okay, so this is pretty, pretty obvious stuff, right? Um, and then part D, they're saying, they're asking to explain without doing any calculation. So, so again, it's qualitative, not quantitative. How astronomers can deduce that star B has a larger diameter than star A? So here's B, here's A. They have about the same luminosity. Remember the, um, the, um, the magnitude of the multiple, the stellar radii, were, the, were those um, lines that went up the diagonal lines. So B and A, B is clearly, um, B is clearly, B clearly has a larger radius and hence diameter than A, okay? But A is a much higher surface temperature and they both have about the same luminosity. Well, how could that be? Well, obviously TB is less than TA, but the luminosities are the same, okay? 
by the relationship that L equals sigma times A times T to the fourth, star B must have a larger area, okay? All right, so that's how that works there, okay? All right, I wanna talk about one more application of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. It's kind of a quantitative um, um, application of determining how far apart, uh, actually, it's a method of finding distance to a star using luminosity and apparent brightness, okay? So this has nothing to do with parallax, even though it's a way of determining a distance to a star, okay? Now, from, from, a, from apparent brightness, we had this uh, equation before in my previous videos, and we found that we could rearrange this algebraically to solve for d, all right? Now, what we do is we find, um, we can determine through Wien's law, we can determine the maximum wavelength uh, of, the, um, of that star, okay? Which tells us temperature. And then once we get that temperature, we use the HR diagram, and we figure out um, what's going on. Let me show you an, an example, example two. So, past paper question. The maximum wavelength of a distant star is measured to be 600 nanometers, okay? And its apparent brightness is given. What is its distance from Earth? Well, the first thing you want to do is find the temperature using Wien's law. I get that it's about 4,800 Kelvin. Now, from the HR diagram, uh, this luminosity equals about, 4,800 is about right here, so the luminosity equals about one, the luminosity of our sun approximately, okay? And then you just use um, D here to solve once you have the um, apparent brightness, okay? Or the luminosity, I mean, and you get that uh, it's about 584 light years, okay? Pretty cool. Note that the apparent brightness, B, is given in the question here. Um, pretty cool. So that's a sort of a quantitative way of using Wien's law in conjunction with the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram to determine distances to stars. And it turns out that spectroscopic parallax can determine pretty accurately the distances to stars farther away from st than stellar parallax method can.